Um, it's really been a unique opportunity. And as we've kind of progressed, it's unique to see science being innovated because there's a lot more frontiers out there, a lot more opportunities for us to go to. And so we can just kind of look at it. Um, it was, I guess, Dr. Hooper made the introduction to Ronnie and Howard, and we first started talking about what are we gonna test? And I've always been one of those to go after the most difficult thing first. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if you're in school, there's a bully on the playground, the first thing you do is you go after that bully, and then you know everybody else is gonna fall in line. Well, endocrinology, <clears throat> excuse me, and being able to test hormones is literally what would be the LCMS bully. It's one of the reasons why when you look around, other labs aren't able to do it because it is loaded with complications and technical difficulties that have to be overcome, much less trying to overcome it in less volume than it's ever been done in any scientific platform. So when we looked at it, when you think about small volume testing, when you do just a quick literature search, because this has become kind of a hot button topic, you hear about it, it's been everything from the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, but if you pull a quick scientific search, you'll find 1,642 publications that are being, in the last year that have been mentioned about small volume samples with some type of clinical aspect. So when you think about the good of it, is depending on the matrix, it may be less invasive than the traditional testing. Collection time is gonna be shorter. If there's a ways around it, it's lower shipping costs. It's also smaller storage requirements. I would say the bad and the ugly of it or the challenging is that the sample handling is gonna be unique to the matrix. Uh, the matrices, there's no special sample, there's no one size fits all for sample prep because you're dealing with blood or you're dealing with saliva. They're different things that have to be contended with. When you think about having to get to small volume, the, one of the challenges is you have less samples. So how do you achieve the sensitivity that's going to be needed when you don't have near as much sample to begin with? And then finally, it's oftentimes is the inability to run the sample multiple times because there's just not enough sample there. So these are some of the same dynamics that are faced. I uh, was one of the first people to develop oral fluid toxicology. So being familiar with that small volume in some of the channels, we decided to step out into what have been the endocrine panel. And I'll say there were some basic objectives we were targeting. One, could we develop a less invasive way to get a baseline measurement on a patient? Could we be able to create a way that a doctor could get a window into that person's endocrine system from not only the parent metabolites when you think about cortisol or testosterone, but even your metabolites like the 11 and the 21 deoxycortisols, the 17 alpha progesterone, so that you could literally see the entire metabolic pathway laid out inside of a patient and get that fingerprint to really get an idea of what's going on. And then finally, while we're shooting for the moon, would be a way to be able to remove the venous puncture altogether and be able to allow this to be some type of point of care device that would allow us to do routine monitoring. So we opened up, and when I first mentioned we went after the standards, we started looking to see what was even commercially available to order as standards. And we kind of came across this panel which basically contained a fairly large swath of the glucocorticoids, your sex hormones, your estrogens, as well as a progesterone. And this right here was to give us a map into not only the sex hormones, but also all the corticosteroids that might be associated with pain, inflammation, and metabolism, even being able to identify things like congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And so we started with this as kind of a base target. Some of the challenges there, when you think about it though, is hormone levels fluctuate. They're an endogenous marker, which means that you have proteins that are gonna bind them things like sex hormone binding globulin. So now is the hormone, instead of it just being like a drug that you're quantifying a value, is it, how, is it a total measurement of the hormone? Is it how much is bound to the protein? Or is it the free? And so these type things begin to weigh in on how you design a system so that you can make a method that's gonna be clinically comparable to something else out there, but being able to bring it into an innovative and new way of doing it. One of the other challenges when you think about mass spec, they measure mass, or they measure how much something weighs. Unfortunately for us, hormones all weigh about the same thing. They all have the same basic structure. So now the challenge begins, you've got something that has all the same weight, the same basic structure, but we need to be able to differentiate every single one of them and then quantify them at a very low level. And so in, in mass spectrometry, there's something known as isobaric pairs. 
Isobaric pairs just means that it's got the same mass and that if it were to break apart, it falls apart exactly the same way. So you have to create some unique process so that you can identify differences in hormones. For instance, aldosterone and cortisone. Or when you think about DHEA, testosterone, and then the E1 metabolite. Exact same mass fragmentation, so you have to develop techniques to be able to identify them properly. And this is where one of the issues you run into with things with amino assays. Because they lack the specificity, it's often difficult to differentiate all of those differences in hormones and where this is the advantage of mass spec. One of the other ones when you think about doing small volume in terms of just endocrine panel challenges is when we're talking about 350 microliters of whole blood. Unfortunately, not all of that blood contains hormones. Right off the bat, the basically blood's gonna break down into what would be your red blood cells, what they call often your buffy coat, and then finally your plasma. Well, if you had 350 microliters, that would mean you'd only have about half of that in plasma, and unfortunately, that's the location of hormones. To complicate it, if you notice, most hormones are missing any type area that can be what's known as a proton acceptor or a donor, because mass specs need something to have a charge on it. If they don't have a charge, then they, for the most part, are invisible to a mass spec. So when you have a molecule that has a lack of some way to get it ionized, a very small amount of sample, the final complication is when you think about cholesterol. Hormones, we're talking about measuring in the range of picograms, nanograms. Cholesterol is often milligrams per deciliter. So you're looking at something a thousand times more concentrated that has the same structure. And so to be able to develop a method that can differentiate all of these things rapidly and simultaneously and then doing it in an extremely small amount of blood is quite innovative. Uh -oh. We're going to be moving quickly because the battery is at 10% on the computer. So that's a great way to keep my speech limited in time. <laughs> All right. So when we just think about it, this, traditionally, this has always been done by venous puncture. Uh, recently at the doctor, I had them run five hormones. It, they required 18 milliliters of blood. With Sanus, I'm able to run the same number of hormones times three and I'm able to do it in 0.3 mils. So we're talking about an enormous, probably 20-fold difference in the amount of blood required to run a much more comprehensive panel. With some of our methodology, basically we're able to do this in a single injection with a semi-automated robotic preparation that gives us about an eight-minute runtime. so that just governs the total throughput. Here's a real brief comparison. Um, in order to protect the innocent or not so innocent, I didn't I use generic names and called them Lab Y, but Lab X. But if you were to go online, you can see some of these and they'll list some of the information on their testing. One of the things that I actually caught as a typo and I did not want to send it to Kristen and try to make her fix it right before I gave this, the volume that they're listing here for these other labs is actually the serum volume. So you would actually have to double any of these values to be comparable to what we're taking in whole blood. This is for our value for milliliters. This is an actual whole blood sample, so we're even lower. So there's really no comparison in the amount of blood we're able to do this amount of tests with. Most of them, when you look at other labs, they're not even gonna list a turnaround time. Most of them won't even stand to give you a value because of the difficulty of it. I know I waited three weeks for my doctor to get his hormone results back, and that was average. Um, with us, most of them are looking at two to three days, and we're using less blood that's ever out there. If you'll also notice, one of the hormones, 21-deoxycortisol, we're also the only ones that can quantify that hormone. So when you think about trying to develop something this innovative, this different, what goes into your mind? How do you even think about building something where you can have it applicable to the current medical process and yet be innovative enough. So the first thing is, can the method even be harmonized to regulatory standards? In other words, there's proficiency testing, there's government agencies that attempt to standardize these type of clinical tests. Can you make a method that's gonna match up with them? Um, would a doctor get the same result as a traditional method? Because one of the difficulties with those that are running, whether it's saliva hormones or urine hormones, is those aren't actionable numbers for a doctor because there's no medical reference value to it. 
It doesn't give a doctor, even though it may be a correct quantitation, it doesn't tell the doctor what to do with that value. Whereas if you can measure in the blood, there's clinical guidelines. In other words, if someone's got a testosterone level below 290 or 275 nanograms per deciliter, well, that for a male would be considered low testosterone. If I measure that in urine and give you a value, there's not a clinical decision that can be made based on that. The next one is, for us especially important, can the capillary prick replace the venous puncture? Because some of the things we've seen in the media lately and with some other tests that are out there, there hasn't been a good correlation. And so one of the first things we wanted to establish is the accuracy and being able to demonstrate that we could cross this type transition, that it could be done by finger prick and produce the same results. The other one that's important is can you get the same result over and over again? You know, a stop clock is right twice a day. Still isn't very effective at keeping you on time for your schedule. So for us, with being able to run a test, can we run and get the same result over and over? And so what I did was out of this, I'll pick, and I won't go into too much detail other than to kind of explain how it works, but I want to be able to show you some of the scientific background and the thought process that went into with peer review and being able to demonstrate it. So one of the first ones we did right off the bat was we had the Center for Disease Control send us some of their samples that they actually do for harmonizing labs that want to participate in hormone testing. And we had them send us 40 of their samples. And we tried to match up because we were very quickly, we wanted to find out, can we even get the right answer? Do we have a rugged method? And right off the bat, if you'll look here, the CDC is plotted on the x-axis with SANUS results on the y. The more this trends along this line, population ranging between less than uh, one nanogram all the way up to eight, we're following a nice linear path. On that population, it's given us a great distribution demonstrating that we're able to correlate. Um, you know, and I'll, I'm one of those as a scientist, I will pick out where we've failed. At around 70 picograms is where we lost less than 95% confidence. What that means is that if you had prepubescent children, that there could be some variation in the answer, but we've been able to demonstrate it with men, women, postmenopausal women, and even elderly men, that we're well within the clinical ranges of what you would find for the adult population. The next one, and it's gonna be very important, is if the doctor were to use a traditional test method, would they get the same result as using the finger prick? Because what you want to be able to have is equivalent results. The whole goal of being able to do this in a finger prick is to the doctor to be able to have a reference value that he can look up and realize that there is some correlation between the two. Working with one of our scientific advisors, Dr. Diamantes, he actually had us sent samples that were tested in their hospital, cortisol and testosterone, under their methods and actually had them run against them as a blind, double blind study. And what we found, if we were the same thing, we plotted Sanus on the x-axis and Mount Sinai on the y for cortisol. What you're seeing for our R squared value right here is a 0.995, or what you would say is a 99.5% correlation with Mount Sinai Hospital with the Sanus capillary finger prick method, which overall that's pretty good. Um, 99.5 is near perfect. Considering R squared of one would be a theoretical perfection, that would probably be me, but so this is a 0.995, it's very close. Um, you can see here we're using just a bland Altman pro, 95% limit of agreement, had incredible numbers, um, which at first point, at that point we started realizing, hey, we've got something special here. Not only did we just develop a way of detecting it, but we are now able to match up with what a large research hospital is able to do with FDA approved assays. And I highlight that because of just the lemon agreement. The next one, which is equally important, is testosterone. Same set of samples were sent to us, measured all the way from less than one all the way up to seven nanograms, or what would be 700 nanograms per deciliter. So all the way through the healthy range for males and females. We had a great correlation. Again, when we get down for some of the females, there would be less than what would be 0.07 nanograms, at that point, we begin to run into lower than 95% uh, limit of accuracy, which this would again fall under like prepubescent children and some of those anomalies. That's the only time we've seen outliers. One of the next one that's just as important and probably one of the hallmarks to be able to demonstrate this over any of the other studies was, can you get the same result from a finger prick where you're taking capillary blood 
from a venous puncture because the traditional method was a phlebotomist and venous puncture and there'd been all kind of thoughts of whether the interstitial, um, interstitial fluids could it compress, throw the numbers off, could it be uh, from clotting factors, all kind of different things were thought as a potential as to why this probably or may not work. So uh, we aggressively pursued being able to try to get this answer as quickly as possible to know that we were on good footing. Right here, this is cortisol. What we've had is about 20 patients that we actually did simultaneous venous punctures with a capillary finger prick. Those were not happy people that day. <laughs> Once you've done the finger prick, you never really want to go back to a venous puncture. Um, at, at 40 years old and been through numerous surgeries, I hate needles. I'm still a big baby when it comes to needles. You could probably measure my blood pressure. It goes up when I see a needle. Um, right here, when you look at it, we've got a 97.3% correlation, and part of that's due to a small population. We had such a limited number, but we still had a very good testing range from what would be is less than 50 nanograms per mil all the way as high as 200 nanograms per mil with a really good correlation between vein and cap. You can look at any of the percent differences where we kind of platted those out over all the numbers and retests, and we were within 5% all the way across for some of these hormone testing. And we did kind of a bland Altman for a difference to find out how they were relating to each other to ensure that we were having some of the most accurate results. And when we started seeing this, we realized that we were gonna be able to translate hormones into a capillary finger prick. We were able to match up with a large clinical hospital and we had been able to harmonize our results against what would be the Center for Disease Controls. So we started having a real good confidence in it and we started working to expand it. Again, 97, this is an R value, so it's still a little bit higher, but it's 0.973. The next one, using the same thing, we measured testosterone. Because when you think about it in terms of athletic performance, if I can monitor things like cortisol, testosterone, now I get a very good handle on how my body is in performance. Again, here, using the same fit, we ended up with what would be a 98.987. And this is to actually with a limited study between going from between capillary prick and venous puncture of the patients to demonstrate that we could take blood, whether it was from the vein or from the capillary, we would get the same results and we've been able to demonstrate that those results would match up exactly with what a clinical hospital was got. So this is where we were truly setting things as a precedent to make sure that we had what would be the right answer and we were gonna be confident and what we were able to do. And then we've done, I'm using these two as a kind of a prime example, but each one of our hormones have kind of been through the same process. But I picked two of these because they tend to have more, no, uh, you hear more about it in the news, you hear more about it, whether it's with low testosterone in men, cortisol levels from athletes to people that are dealing with pain. And then finally, could you get them reproduced? I mean, lightning will strike anywhere once. But could we able to take this, could we develop a system that would be rugged enough to give you the same results every day? Because at the end of the day, if you're gonna go into clinical utility, you have to be able to reproduce your results. You can't do it once. If you're able to do it once or twice, that's called a research paper. If you're able to do it every day, that's called a clinical method. So with us, we actually took an external control that was prepared by a third party company and we ran those results day in, day out. Over the course of 33 days is about where we carried it out to. What's very interesting about this is that UTAC claimed the stability of their calibrators was 27 days. Even with it exceeding its stability, what we're looking at is a CV of 10%. CV is measuring how reproducible a result is based on its size. When you think about that, give you an example, most clinical methods are gonna require a CV of less than 20. So the fact that we're at 10%, we're, we're more reproducible than any of the most stringent clinical guidelines within the CLSI. And that was for our low QC and high QC, and these were externally prepared. So this was actually an external calibrator made by someone else that we ran so that we could actually not only verify accuracy, but the reproducibility of it. Testosterone, unbelievable reproducibility at three and a half percent CV over the course of a month, which means that if you, ran, you got your results ran on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, you're gonna get the same results because the, the method itself was designed to be reproducible and rugged so that you would be able to get the same results. Because if you're gonna go into production, you're gonna be able to run larger volumes of samples, it's critical that your method isn't right once, but it's right reproducibly.
Again, if you look at the other one, 6.8% for the QC, unbelievable as far as the reproducibility. And then finally, a lot of the other requirements that are coming down from, whether it's from CMS and different regulatory bodies, all of the different studies, we were able to work through each of these to be able to prove that we were getting good results. I want him some of the validation data for linearity. Um, if you have more questions, feel free to ask me about any of the science afterwards. A lot of it's on our website. Uh, as my wife often warns me when I start getting into science, I see blank stares on people and they kind of know them over. It's almost like a sedative. It's kind of like my version of Ambien to most of the population. So I want everybody to stay conscious while we're going through it. But if you look at it overall, we've got really good CVs, real good linearity. With being able to take this theoretical linearity, if all things being perfect, and I use this as just a mathematical model, well, you would literally be able to take down to seven picograms in theory. And that's just based on a standard deviation of the y-intercept, um, just a clinical mathematical model. Now, what I've given you and what we've heard so far is inspiration, we've heard information. And both of those are great, but here's where I'm gonna show you some application. And because at the end of the day, the goal is to be able to make new technology applicable and be able to see how I can do, you can do something unique with this that just would not be available commercially. So one of the things is we wanted, I'm gonna show you is uh, recently, because I had a, I hate to say it, that I'm giving up personal health information, but it's me, so I'm, I've waived my rights. So I'm just gonna show you some of the data. Um, really was the first one was dexamethasone. It's very common. It's known as a dexamethasone suppression test. If you get a cortisol shot, your natural cortisol levels will basically go down to almost zero, and then they measure the rebound effect. Normally, my levels were averaging about 130, 26. The doctor gave me a cortisol, I forget which one it was, Decadron, or one of the cortisol shots. Within 48 hours, I watched my numbers drop down. Within 48 to 72 hours, they had returned right back to where they were, but we were able to actually witness the effect of a dexamethasone suppression effect that would be occurring from someone receiving a cortisone shot. We've seen this with another patient, but I didn't have a baseline for them. I probably know more about my hormones now and the numbers and the averages and the routine. Uh, one of the other ones, ah, it didn't come out as good as I'd like, is the effect of stress. So if you were doing venous puncture, you can imagine how difficult it would be on your body to take a venous puncture every day to measure your cortisol level. One of the things we wanted to do, because I noticed toward the end of the week, for a while there, I started seeing toward the end of the week, I was having higher and higher cortisol levels. So what I said was, what if I could just start monitoring mine every day at the same time, just to watch where my numbers go? And so it's kind of hard to see here, but basically day one would have been a Monday through Friday. I didn't measure it on Saturday and Sunday, but this would have been the following week. So over the course of three weeks, what I'm watching is a trend of my cortisol levels going up, more caffeine, less sleep, more coffee. And as I'm having more and more coffee, as you're going through the end of the week with less sleep, my cortisol levels will go up, I'm resting, recuperating, I'm spending time with the family on the weekends, and all of a sudden on Monday, I'm back into normal range. But I started watching these patterns over the course of a week, and I was like, wow, you can, this is almost becomes a marker where if I would have been using venous puncture, there's absolutely no way I could have made this kind of testing. And so just to be able to see the effect of stress, caffeine, and lack of sleep during a work week on my cortisol levels. So then we started thinking about it, in terms of athletic performance. If now all of a sudden I can try to watch my cortisol levels, watch the way my diet and training affects me, now I'm able to adjust. But more than that, I started thinking about supplements because I came from the bodybuilding community, powerlifting, or vitamins and supplements. And so one of the thoughts I had in my mind was that a lot of times they sell DHEA over the counter as a supplement. And I was really thinking that it's probably not bioavailable, just out of curiosity. So. Got a few scientists in the lab, we rounded up and we started monitoring to see what would happen if we took it. And what we found is if we took it twice a day, morning and evening, 50 milligrams, oh man, these are not coming in as good as I'd like. But, and I've got it on some of the, I think on our website it's there too, what we started seeing was you were actually, when you got on it, three to four fold increases in the actual DHEA level. Really didn't come in as good as I like, but you could, we were actually, so it was actually kind of a surprise. I was really ready to call up a supplement manufacturer and let them know that it wasn't gonna be any good and that if you took this supplement, it wasn't gonna work. 
And lo and behold, right off the bat, I mean, granted this population was only four of us doing it, but the fact that we were able to witness our DHEA levels go up, and then when you got off of the supplement, come back on down, you were able to actually see how supplements were doing, but the only way that they made that possible is the fact that we had small volume blood, we had a very fast way of being able to assay all the hormones so that the hormones were actually multiplexed together, and it gave us the ability to acquire this information very quickly that just isn't possible with venous puncture. And so for that, being able to make these type of applications just kind of gives you a window in terms of patient treatment and being able to work with patients to be able to provide the best possible outcome that really isn't available in any other type of hormone testing. And so really what we found is that while these small volumes present unique, they're not insurmountable challenges, that they, are, they can be overcome, that there are ways to improve, develop, and if the science is solid, you're able to make these type of transitions. Um, the unique part is we're able to do multiple analytes and we've been able to do them with accuracy. And really what the goal is being able to provide accurate information and really the minimally evasive way to the patient and care provider. Now, they say that the best never rest. And so there's a couple of other things that are, we're working on next because the goal, as Ronnie said earlier, was to be able to develop not just one technology, not be um, a one-hit wonder. And all of a sudden, my brain goes back to a lot of the 80s bands. But, the, you know, you had that one song. The goal is to be able to constantly be evolving, being able to develop new technology on what would be a small-volume blood platform to be able to roll new things out. So... There's really two, one of them we're looking, probably the next generation will be something as a small sample serum toxicology panel. The ability to now make use of things like the Goodman and Gilman ranges. So right now, if you look at Goodman and Gilman's kind of like, they've got kind of the, I'll call it the Bible of pharmacology, but they give you a lot of plasma concentrations and drugs. Wouldn't it be great to now all of a sudden have this point of care device where you're able to see plasma concentrations of any of the drug medications in their metabolites? The other one is to be able to look at some of these endogenous markers and some other therapeutic drugs. But we're really, for, for the tox, we're gonna target about 60 to 80 analytes and do this in same small volume of blood. And within that, we'll probably get about six or seven different classes of stimulants, barbiturates, muscle relaxers, opiates, psychiatric medications, as well as some of the substance of abuse, but be able to do this now in a very small volume of blood from the finger prick. And what's unique about this is where hormones all had the same shape, this is a large, diverse set of structures to try to be able to pull out of blood and be able to quantify. But we've got a lot of the chemistry worked out and so this is one of the next panels. A little further down the road and to be able to target what I would consider more of the endogenous markers that are gonna be circulating in blood and I think this is kind of to give that complete health and wellness perspective which is we're all trying as we get older and the generation, you try to become healthier, you try to find these things that give you insight into how your body's performing. Why are you feeling the way? How can I improve my health as a whole? Not just being reactive to disease, but becoming proactive in how to improve my health and wellness overall. And being able to look at what would be inflammatory markers, um, some of the neurotransmitters, the products of the neurotransmitters, as well as some of the basic therapeutic drug monitors that need to be done in blood. Things like Depakote or Gabapentin, Phenobarbital, Ibuprofen. When you think about people that are dealing with pain, and I didn't have it on there, but acetaminophen. The fact that acetaminophen depletes glutathione levels and being able to understand that even things like lard tab or Vicodin, if they're taking it three times a day and then they're taking Tylenol on top of that, is it enough to actually deplete their glutathione levels? Is it becoming toxic to their liver where they might need an alternate form of opiate therapy? Uh, some of the other was to be able to move toward, is rounding out more hormone type testing, is T3 and reverse T3 in the thyroids, as well as looking at some of the amino acids and vitamins so that now you get what would be in a metabolic breakdown of how the body's health and performance is going. So the idea is that to not, while we've increased, we've created something quite amazing in terms of hormones and endocrinology that may be the first, this is without a doubt the first of its kind, to st not stay just there, but to evolve being able to create toxicology as well as more of these endogenous biomarkers and being able to scale it. The unique part about us being able to scale into small volume is it doesn't limit us to small volume. We have the ability to test large volume of blood just like anybody else. It's just that we're innovating our science in a way that we can create a, what would be a point of care type of collection to allow it to be done 
as Dr. Hooper said, with rural patients that may be not able to make it into the doctor, that they need this type of monitoring. So now a patient can almost monitor themselves and send the sample in. Or instead of having a phlebotomist or a doctor or a nurse tying up their time with a venous puncture, in a clinic, you've got a medical assistant just there being able to collect the requisition, making it very easy on the doctor, easy on the practice to be able to roll this type of testing out. Because the goal is being able to make the patient care easier for both the doctor and the patient so that you can improve lives. And so really just a few people, we had Dr. Diamandis that really, one of our scientific advisors, we had the Center of Disease Control. I think Trinity, because they actually had nurses come over and do all the blood draws for us because we were trying to get this venous capillary. It was really a big scare. It was incredible to be able to prove that our venous and capillary results were the same. That was probably one of the hallmarks of being able to know that you've really got something rock solid to carry forward. Um, Biotage, Shimadzu, just for the equipment and being able to use some of the more advanced technology. And so with that, I mean, that's really kind of it.